Good morning, everybody. Mac, welcome. Thank to you. Person. <laughs> Good to be here. Um, Judy Camuso is um, on her way, so she is online and listening in. So um, I am going to skip introductions since we are basically day two of a, of a single board meeting. Um, we we have some work that we have to go through here, obviously, before uh, on the public side, before we go into executive session and go through the ground rules again here in a minute. Um, I just to again remind the board, we do have a per diem form here. Um, Max, we are uh, um, information for a little housekeeping. Bathrooms are down the hall to the left. Our <laughs> um, so with that, why don't we, unless Sarah has anything for us before we get to ground rules, why don't we go right to ground rules? Go right, go right to it. Okay. So just as a reminder for ground rules, public attendance is welcome here today. We do not have any members of the public here. We do have a few people online. Um, this is a working meeting. Board members may direct questions to the applicants through the chairman. So if we do have a question of this particular proposal, we can go back to the applicant for clarification if needed. Um, uh, board chair will indicate the appropriate time when public comment regarding a proposal may be provide, provided. This is an interesting one because I feel like we've already had a public process. So I'm going to, uh, I am going to limit that to a certain extent um, just because of the day. But if we do get to a spot where uh, we do have an applicant that thinks we may have incorrectly referenced part of the application, then I may come back to that and allow somebody to uh, make a comment. Uh, proposals are confidential until scored. Uh, this prevents undue influence on the board through the scoring process and is in accordance with the SOM purchasing policies. Board members will refrain from discussing proposals with applicants, as you did the other night at the event. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I wasn't able to get a single bribe. Really <laughs> I think it was unbelievable. I, I did. I had my hand up behind my back. Yeah, yeah we saw that. Yeah. <laughs> So board members will refrain from discussing proposals with applicants, the public, or members of the press um, uh, before, during, and after the meeting. Uh, scoring is based on the information contained in the proposals. Uh, those here to observe will avoid any actual or appearance or attempts to influence the scoring process. Likewise, board members will refrain from asking questions of the public. Conflict of interest. Uh, again, LMF statute states if a charge See, I got it right. If a charge of bias or personal financial interest, direct or indirect, is filed against a member requesting that members to re requesting that member to withdraw from a proceeding of the board, that member shall determine whether or not to withdraw and shall make the determination part of the record for that proceeding. Um, we do have several commissioners here who are sponsoring, and when we get to this, um, uh, Commissioner Beal and I just talked about it during the during the um, uh, executive session. Obviously, members of the public and applicants will not be a part of this, but I do allow staff from the agencies to remain in the room uh, to help um, us lowly commissioners who uh, need a little help. Um, I don't know where all my staff is because I probably need more help than the other two. Um, and um, I think the way to proceed with the uh, application that are being sponsored either by IFNW or DACF um, is to allow the commissioners to um, participate in the discussion uh, and, re and recuse themselves from the vote. Um, as long as there's no objections to that, that's how I would handle that as chair. Um, and I think you're... Do you mean, so if we're sponsoring, we're the sponsoring agency because I, I think we were talking about the ones that have direct... Uh, linkages to our yeah, yeah, like so application exactly. to, the to, to the to the application itself. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Thank so, you for that. So there yes. Are two. yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry for that. Um, uh, does that sound all right from a board perspective? It. You got mm -hmm. it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then number seven, the board will endeavor to stick to the agenda. And um, I look at Jim. Uh, and avoid <laughs> the broad, broader topics that may not relate to the scoring process. Um, and uh, the consensus scoring. Um, LMF statute says that if a charge of, wait, no, 
We already did that. We already did that. Already did that. Did that. Next slide. Maybe, maybe the last paragraph is the only thing new there, but. Uh, uh, oh, it's okay. Oh, yeah. Well, now you want me to read the last. You were that trigger finger. <laughs> I swore I'd do better. Yeah. Uh, it's okay to abstain from scoring uh, or participation in the discussion on a particular proposal at your discretion. Uh, this is what will help the board maintain transparency, predictability, process, and maintain within the process and maintain program integrity. Guidelines um, for the consensus scoring. The goal of the scoring and evaluation processes are to ensure fairness and objectivity in the review of the proposal and ensure the funds are awarded to the bidder whose proposal best satisfies the criteria of the RFP. Remember, we are not comparing proposals against other proposals. We are grading them on, the, on their face value. In the consensus scoring process, the committee scoring is by consensus. Consensus means that everyone can live with the decision, although they might not totally agree. Uh, differences of opinion among the board are expected. If consensus cannot be reached, the board will take a vote and we will do those votes um, because they are all on um, uh, accepting or rejecting um, by roll call uh, based on the policy. Where there is general consensus, uh, adopt board average scores. We'll discuss the criteria where there are scoring discrepancies or the average score is not an eligible score. Reminder, major land assets can receive points in addition to land and additional land assets and additional land assets are capped at 25 points. Right. And I'm going to pause there. So I so. Sarah and I did talk about this early on. I think I mentioned it uh, two days ago, but I think when, you know, as we're going down through here, if we are close um, from an average around a score, um, I'm not, I, I'm of the opinion, let's not beat a dead horse, right? I mean, we're close enough. Yeah. Um, and then I think at the end, really, it's where the, the meat of the discussion will come as far as um, how we're going to get at the executive session and how we're going to Exactly. Yeah. So um, what, oh. what we're going to do is have Jason project the scores so that you can see and we'll go project by project and staff have highlighted those areas where there are discrepancies. So we, we which should help us focus on where we need to talk and where we don't need to talk. Yep. And I'll turn my cell phone down, right? <laughs> Looking at me. <laughs> I did it already. But before we start, any questions from the from the board? Any comments from the board? Same Quick question. question. Yeah. Which score am I looking for here? The final one? We are going to go through each of the um, scores. So there are multiple scoring criteria for each project. We're going project by project. And we are only going to discuss those. The suggestion is that we only discuss those that are highlighted yellow in order to develop a consensus score. Can you bigger? <laughs> Jason, can you increase it at all? Well, I think what we, Laura, what happens if you focus on, there we go, does that help? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can yep. I just, for clarification, so that I understand the yellow ones felt deviated. But I'm, did they deviate from, um, well, I mean, they're just one point off the staff score. Is that, what, do you, what deviation are you looking so at? So for the first one, the significance of major land asset, an eligible score is 10 or 15. The average is 11. That's not an eligible score. So we need to come to agreement on whether it's a 10 or a 15. Oh, I see. Okay, so even though it's one point, you're just yeah. saying we need to say, is it a four or six? Exactly. Or, okay. Yep. It's yep. not a major deviation. It's just not allowable. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And some of them will, there are others that will be, we need to clarify this um, because of access. And for those, we've created slides to explain to you what the eligible scores are, and then you can then decide which one to allocate. Sure, you said it before, but why did we do the two plus six deal instead of 
mechanics. It, that those are the scores that you approved for the workbook. Yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember the reason why we broke it. I think there were some of those that had been in place for years, and we just decided when we did those modifications to the scoring that it worked, and it was. Yeah, we went from a 140 plus point oh, yeah. base to a hundred point base. Yeah, and that's how we ended up with the scores that we have to get us to a hundred point base. Two four six. It makes to a hundred. It makes to a hundred easier than odd no, numbers. <laughs> shortens that's the, the shortens the process. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's let's start with major land asset here. Again, we're on. Um, you can see Bonnie Bonnie Day Mountain was the project. Yeah, Bittner, don't don't worry about that slide for now. That's like just waiting for when we need to talk about it. Look at the screen to the left. Um, and um, Jason, you're going to be recording the scores live, correct? That is correct. All right. It's closer to 10 than 15. Yeah, there's some discussion. Things yeah. like that, I don't even think where it's one point. I don't even really know if we need to discuss. So, I would. Some some people gave it 15, so we wanted the opportunity to. The faster we do it, the better, in my opinion. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we have to look at the average and group consensus. Yeah, and I think everybody's. If it's 12 or 13, we could discuss it. <laughs> at, at 11. Just one more clarification. Yep. If I'm okay with my preliminary scores and I'm legal, I didn't do a five when I should have. Sure, sure, sure. Four. Do I need to fill in this final score column? We are recording it. Okay. We are doing that. So okay. you, you can do it for your own purposes or you for can it, wait till the minutes come up. Yeah, got it. <laughs> All right, so the next one we have is vital ecological values. Again, uh, must be a four or a six. So this is I'm open to uh, a proposal from one of the members of the board on how to how to handle these. I'll propose a six. I thought uh, the resilience here was uh, strong. The unusual pagonias, the deer wintering are the vernal pools, the blandings turtle, the red moose fen, mate red maple fen, the uh, the swamp saxifrage. I just thought there were a lot of uh, ecological values that they brought uh, to this. Slide. Like, but, I, but three out of the things you mentioned are covered are covered in the next attribute about the eco uh, the rare. And endangered species, and you, you may recall I asked about this one because in, um, there really was a distinction between what was on this property. There was a lot of information about lens, turtles, swamps, saxifrage, red maple fens, but it's for the beginning with habitat focus area. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I Really, all that's going on here in terms of, of uh, rare species, the so five individual orchid plants. Um, and actually, when I'm jumping ahead a little bit, I went from six to two on the next one. And in turn, in this particular one, I, I, I went with four. But anyway. <clears throat> I guess I gave them credit for being in a larger area where these, I mean, the likelihood of these being on the property are, I think, fairly great. But I'm well, not going to. not. I mean, in, in some cases where, and that's why I ask, if, yeah, it's true. If you haven't actually seen landing turtle on the property, you can say, well, maybe there's one there. But this, there's not habitat for these turtles on this property. You didn't feel there's habitat? What's that? You didn't feel there was habitat suitable for the blanding turtles? I, I actually know blanding turtles. I've had three graduate students study them. And they are, they're not up on the sides of mountains like this. They're, they're, they're down in the, the red maples uh, then. Uh, I gave them generous, you know, score, but I, I'm okay with a four. If, if you know that these things aren't really on this property. Well, again, this one's more, the, when, we're talking, when we're talking about these turtles, it's more about rare and endangered. Yeah. And that's why really on this property, and that earned them a two in my book. 
<laughs> so I'm going to um, see if we can get a compromise uh, for for vital ecological values. And um, I'll let you guys negotiate a four or a six for rare and endangered. I had four and I'm comfortable with so four. four and four. I'm OK. With I'm OK. Yeah, okay. And then scenic Good. features. I'm going to just suggest we go six as a well, compromise. We have done rare and endangered, right? Uh, that was the four, I thought. Oh, I thought we were in vital ecological. We in vital. Okay. okay, so four for vital ecological. And endangered. I'm sorry, Catherine, I thought you were saying four for that one as well. No, I, I thought we were still on the vital. Um, for rare and endangered, I did have a six on that one, um, but. Yeah. I'm going to compromise on sure. I would compromise you know, it's, on it's, it's inter, you know, it's an interesting dilemma because we're going to see it again about. Um, and it really comes down to a personal thing to me, like you said, you had a six. I, I did as well. Um, to have a, an endangered species to me was very significant period. So, uh, you know, that's why I gave it six. Um, and, you know, not knowing quite the extent of the endangered side. Um, so when I went through these, if there was an endangered species on it, I tended to give it uh, um, significantly more credit. And I didn't break it down to whether there were two or three or one. I think whatever that was, that's where that I, was staff as well. Like, yeah. We don't we only have very small number of federally listed endangered plants in the state. And the fact that we had one was pretty exciting. Pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. So and how just, many of us had six uh, on that one? I did. I had six, but six. listening to Mac, yeah. I would compromise, compromise with a four. With a four. Yeah, I'm happy Mac is the expert. Yeah. So yeah. Four is you comfortable? If we I'm comfortable with yeah. four, too. Yeah. Okay. So we're at four. Scenic features. I would say four. Four was that small. Yeah, I'm fine. Consensus at four. Sounds good. Reluctant. <coughs> All right. Okay. So final score on this will be eighty-five. All right, Bittner. Laura, can you go to the Bittner slide? Yes. Yeah. We do have the um, scoring criteria available. Should we need to refer to it? You know, if something comes up and it's unclear. OK, so this is the project that had um, uh, access when the proposal came in. It was sort of described in one way between the time the proposal came in and the board met. There was some additional information available. Um, Jason, is this your project? Yeah. No, no. So the situation here is that the town of West Bath has agreed to provide a an access easement across that uh, brown property to the north of this uh, of this parcel. That right of way has not been granted yet. Uh, so that by our by our scoring criteria as published would be uh, fall into that one to three points category. This the Summary was confusing because it also did note that if it had been granted, then we would have started at a five, which I think is what a lot of maybe a lot of the board members picked up on and giving it the you know in the average coming to a five. And in all honestly, I don't know if I would call it if it's a bind, fully binding contract at this point, which but because the process to get a binding contract for the town involves town meetings and also because we would kind of like our attorney to weigh in before anything gets signed to make sure that the Access these meet element purposes. We kind of gave them that gave them the benefit of the doubt as far as the binding versus non-binding agreement. And that's how we got to three points, and that and that's the scoring criteria. Yeah, commissioner. Sure. I just I'm a little bit confused about this. It <laughs> says in there it is confusing <laughs> that the property is currently accessible to the public via the large network of multi-use trails in the Lily Pond area. It has multiple public access points, including Kelts Lily Pond Community Forest and Reef Reserve. So what? So oh, our so, so our criteria, Laura. Maybe you can put our criteria up there. Sure. Uh, the distinction is that all those there's an existing trail, trail network, but it's large. It's crossing private land to get to this parcel. So 
All of those stuff. access points are all yeah. of these access points to get to this parcel cross private land. Okay. So that's the that's why uh, got scored the way it did. You want to go back to the slide? Uh, all right. I just want to disclose that I'm on the help board and their lands committee, and I have a little bit of additional information that I want to offer. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that's okay with my. If it's is it in regards to the access issue? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, go ahead. So there's actually legal access to a public road to this parcel. You see that long skinny stretch that goes to the public road. There is legal access to this property there. Um, I don't think that they presented that very well in their proposal. It's not going to be super functional access for the public, and I think that's that's why we didn't count it. Yeah. That's why we didn't count it because they said they couldn't yeah. get a DOT entrance permit. Yeah. So it is there. However, it's not functional. Yeah, but you do have the other access, or potentially the other access from the city of Bath. Exactly. That's what we're there relying was a on. Yeah. Yep. That so to me, that's, that's what that is something that gets worked out. That city of Bath access point involves a trail of wooden pallets across. That's the right. Road, it's which, it, and it's <laughs> across multiple parcels. You know, so yes. But that will. That's an issue to me as I looked at it because I, I I gave it a zero. I don't like projects that have questionable uh, access to them. Um, but I think we've got the ability of or, or the benefit of time on our hands to work this out through the due diligence process here, don't you think? Um, and so it's one of those projects that we could add it. We could approve at some level with the understanding that Due diligence has to show us that they've got strong, strong access in the future. This is a great example of a project where you might put a condition on it. Exactly. Where you, you yeah. know, when they bring their appraisal in, you may want to have an update on the status of yeah. of the, the access. Yeah. Um, but so, it's still, to me, it still deserves some credit for what actually does exist if we're right. looking at a range and as, we're a, asking, as opposed to zero. Right. The, the eligible points based on our scoring criteria are one to three. So we need a proposal from you all on how you'd like to apply those points. So my for, originally I had a three and then I changed it to a five, but now I'm back to a three because I'm concerned about the precedent that it might set <clears throat> for others going forward. You can't hold within the scoring criteria if we grant them a five when we only are actually eligible for a three. Right. So I'm guess I'm comfortable with a three. I'm comfortable with three and I. I like the idea that before the appraisal, they will come forward with defined access. Uh, that will be reflected as a hypothetical condition, probably in the, with the appraisal. In the appraisal. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's assuming there's a yeah. vital, vital. I think if the condition is that we, we don't want the appraisal, if right. anything's assumed, we want to. Right. Yeah. Right. That is that staff will have to work with the applicant on just how to describe that scope of work. I, I had it as a three and I went up to a five based on the information we got during their presentation. I can certainly live with a three. Okay. We, do we have consensus on a three? Okay. Three, okay. We've got head Great. odds consensus on three. Okay. Next project. Oh, oh we got one more. Oh, yeah, just that um, some people gave their wintering area points to projects um, and there were no projects eligible for deer wintering points in this funding round because only projects held by IFNW are eligible for those points. So there are a couple of places where we noted that and a blanket statement should cover it. All of them are getting zero for deer wintering area, just so you know. Good. Next project. Okay, this is Camp Gustin, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we need um, the significance. Um, again, this is where it must be a five or a ten. It sounds like, based on your prior statements, that people are okay with a ten. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we need to clarify for water access, whether that will be a four or a six. I gave it a six myself and didn't understand how it, it didn't get a six from, from 
from everybody uh, because of uh, it, just a lot of lake frontage. 1,800 feet on yeah. Loon Pond. Yeah. Everybody okay with the six? Yeah. And hitting on. Okay, let's we'll put it to six. Wait a minute, what was the final oh, score in that one? Water access six. And the oh, final oh. total? What was the final score? 73. Yeah, I'm Did keeping track of the final scores for my own personal safety. Yeah. We can go to the bottom each time. What was the final yeah. score? Do you have the final score in Bittner as well? Bittner's final score was a 68. Thank you. What was the final score on Bittner? 68. 68. 68. Yeah. And the first one was 85. Okay. One more. Okay. Okay, cooking with gas now. All right, this is the East Windham project. Uh, okay, so this is one where proximity, again, this is one of those scoring criteria where there are eligible ranges and the average score did not fall within an eligible range. So um, the slide on the right shows that staff identified one, two, three, four um, criteria were met and um, a, a common um, mistake that was made both by staff and I think by the board was that one of the criteria is two to four and the other one is more than four. And, it, and I think several people saw the four and just applied eight to 10. Um, so I, that, that's a note to us that we need to make our criteria a little more uh, clear in the future. It should but be five and more. And it should be five or more. Yeah, yeah. and also because it was to piece, four, I, think. I gave it a seven because it's at yeah. the top of the range. Yep. So I would I recommend well. we go with seven. Perfect. Everybody okay with seven? seven? Okay. All right, significance. Significant. We, we went with the 10. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then um, open space. It needs to be a four or a six. And you'll recall. Uh, I gave it a six on this particular one. Yeah, I did too. I gave, so it, did I. I gave it a six. I can't remember all the reasons yeah. right now. I, I think because it's in a in, relatively in a Wyndham, ur southern Maine, relatively yeah. urban area, yeah. and it's a pretty significant so maybe, chunk too, for, yeah, yeah. for that part of the world. Yeah. So six. That is six. Yes. So final score. 88. 88. Huh? I'm assuming Judy's listening in and will speak up. And uh, uh, Camuso, if you want to say something, yell. <laughs> assuming she'll chime in if she needs to. I will. I will. I've been paying attention and I'm I'm comfortable with everything that you um, okay. said so far. Okay. All right. Accessibility was we're eleven. We Oh, this is where we have a slide, Laura, for oh, Port of Brian. Um, okay, so this is where we need to uh, get our score into an eligible score range. Um, so the property abuts and will be accessed across adjacent existing conservation land held by the applicant and which is located adjacent to a public way. Th this parcel fits that criteria to a T. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like that is this was made for this. So the eligible um, range is eight to ten for this yep. project. Okay, ten. Yeah. Yeah, it's ten. Perfect. Ten. Ten. We'll go with a ten. And then um, Islander undeveloped coastline that just needs to be adjusted up or down. I did a six. Yeah, I did a six too. It's a small piece, but it's a six. Yeah. Sounds good. We'll go with six. I'm not hearing any yep. objections. Cool. Matt, did you have a thought? Um, yeah, I'm surprised. Uh, climate. Average score was a five. Okay. Yep. But that can't quite be true because I gave it a zero. <laughs> and maybe it's averaging. Yeah, yeah maybe it's 4.8. Uh, for the only one, then it doesn't quite move it enough to show up as a. All right. So, but that's a I, on it, but I, I have a big problem with this one because 
we have a really nice quantitative metric of, for the for the climate resilience thing, and it's and it was ignored in this case, I think. And people said, "Oh, it's we got coastline that's eroding, and it's going to um, bumper the, the sea, the sea level rise issues." I was looking at staff pretty much here. Yeah, staff pretty much it's above it's average. It's above average, and all the that's, that's what I did too. Is I looked at those back the three meters and okay. Uh, I stand corrected. Yeah, I so I. I made a mistake. There was one, there was oh, one wow. later on that was below and also got yeah. five. I, I, okay. I think I know the one you're talking about. We'll stay there. Maybe I flipped the two. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there, is, there, there are some rounding um, quirks to this. So if yeah. you see something that doesn't make sense, that's probably what it is. Okay, so final score on, on Fort O'Brien was? Oh, I'm sorry. 75. 75. Great pond. All right, I think it kind of has a slide as well. Okay, so this is one where we need to make a decision. There are two different parcels. What staff did in your scoring is essentially um, average um, the scores of two different parcels with two different sets of features on all places except accessibility. That was the one place where we didn't feel we could average the score and come up with a defensible number. I think some things for you all to think about is you can provide two separate scores. You can go with the higher or the lower of the two different scores and just stick with that. Whatever we do, I think is fine. It's just that we wanted to do it publicly and on the record so that we have a record of what the decision was and we can go with it. It's two separate parcels, but I, I, I thought of it as one as far as the application process is concerned um, and ended up on the a little bit. Of, I think I ended up on the higher side. I did the same thing to me. It's it's one cohesive. Yeah. Also, so why did part of, of it isn't accessible? Yeah. Well, because one part's on a public road and one part is accessed across their existing land and in our workbook those are two different scores and, yeah. now i understand how it came about but to, uh, i tended to uh, as you said yep. Pick the yep. yep yep so are we recommending 15. you can definitely do that i take a more global view here and when we eventually get to discussing scoring you know, I'd like to rethink this because to me, in some ways, it's either accessible legally or it's not, you know, mm -hmm. and then it's not really but eligible. It's kind of how I break it down. Yeah. Is it, is it I can guaranteed and preferred in perpetuity or is it questionable? I can't totally get my mind around grading the quality of the road or the well, yeah. You know, yeah. State road or a, yeah. yeah. At some yeah. point in the future, I want to discuss the, yeah. the whole proximity metric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. For staff, the accessibility comes into play because we have to do the legal analysis with our attorneys, and it and it does matter <laughs> from our perspective. But I understand your perspective may be different. So we had someone suggest a fifteen. Is that Are you okay with fifteen? So you had nods. Let's move on. All right, we're going to skip over significance and just follow your prior guidance there. Water access. Water access. A lot of frontage. Yeah. yeah. I think something to think about, however, in, in terms of how staff think about water access is, is the water access accessible? It's that is really into, uh, about not just the riparian features and the, that that water is present, but how is it being used for the public? So that that was staff thoughts is like this is not especially accessible. It's water, but it's not especially accessible. There's been a number of pro you know I recall a number of projects in the past where there was a lot of a lot of water frontage, but there was only one. Tiny area that was awkward to get to, one in Brunswick, I think I remember. But that point came home that it was not always usable waterfront. It might have been an incredible amount. 
Yeah. We had the similar conversations in the Pleasant River area yep. down east too. Yeah. Yeah. And I just put a plug in for access doesn't have to mean with your feet or with a boat. You know, it can be birding access, it can be visual, it can be for a photographer. So I take a, you know, I think water access can mean different things to different people. I gave it a four. And if they were going to build a trail to it, that would make it accessible yeah. for birding. Yeah. <laughs> but without a trail, it's it's you're bushwhacking. So that that's sort of the quality. I go even water. broader because I take water access to uh, from the perspective of turtles and frogs too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> four. 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 And river or trail system. Two on the staff. We were at a three. It's got to be a two or a four. I think it's too big to fill it. So I gave it a two. Yeah. I did as well. Yeah, let's go with two. The fifth one. What about um, vital ecological values? I gave it a six because of, of all the this extensive. I mean, basically, it's almost between what they already own and what they're going to gain. They're getting virtually the entire shoreline of a small pond, a gave, medium sized pond. I gave it a six. I'm comfortable with a six. Everybody go to the six, isn't it? Okay. Where my mother is. No, no, but I, I know I've paddled this. Yeah, I know the area. I've hated it. I've paddled it. Yeah. Great. And so, final is 81. 81. All right. So the only one we need to discuss is rare and rare and endangered. And again, this is one that had a rare natural community type on it that was of a uh, not great quality, but still uh, an important example so that it only got a two for me i actually took it down two points because this I, when i think of a this is all about the uh, pitch pine woodland and the you recall my asking a question about its its condition mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've, I've climbed this my recollection is that it is uh it's basically it's pitch pine trees. It's not a forest community, given the extent of trails through it and, and so forth. Six acres is a very is very small for this kind of community. So how big is the pitch pine? Six within, acres. Six pine acres, but for example, with the Nature Conservancy in Pitch, we have a rare pitch pine. What what do you consider a reasonable size? Tens of acres. Ten? Tens, tens of acres, tens of I would start thinking this is a pitch pine community uh, that's merits a lot of attention. This needs a lot of love, and maybe the pitch pines need a lot of love, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can go with the two. Well, I, was I think more the choice tens. is four or six here. Oh, four or six. Would you be comfortable with a four, Mac? Yeah, I could. I, and in the spirit of compromise, I'm just saying I voted two. Um, yeah. I, 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 I would. I will argue against six. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Happily, so. this is vital ecological. <laughs> no, rare endangered. Yeah. Okay. I was more generous, but I can go to one. Yeah. Final score. Seventy-four. All right, this is Johnson Brooks. This, so that's a, that's a five or a ten. We had a nine, so ten. Yep, I think that's it for this one. Uh, final score is a sixty-five. This is Keith Are. Keith Are. And oh, this is one where there was complete consensus. <laughs> the only one. <laughs> but score seventy-eight. Um, 
Yeah, that's why I say it too, but they say the keys are out there. So I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be sensitive. I, you know what? I can't. Boy, I hate to do this, but uh, look at Johnson Brook. Yeah, okay. It's got a lot more uh, spotted than Blanding's turtle habitat on it. They didn't emphasize it, but it's got a lot more than them uh, up at Bonnick Bay. Yes, um, sure. <laughs> I gave a four. Uh, on, we're not only giving it a. Um, endangered. So I think we may be. Are we in Johnson Brook now? No, no, Johnson no, Brook, no yes. I, I, I went back at Max's request. Wait, where's okay. John? Is Kizar Johnson Brook? No, no. Two separate. Oh, talking about local. We've gone back like Johnson two projects. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which one are you talking about? Johnson? It's the one okay. in Kittery, Sisk. Johnson yeah, I got a zero here, and I gave it a four. And the same well, you're talking about rare, threatened, and endangered. Yep. Yeah, Max looking at potential habitat, whereas we were looking at what is the data that we know is there, and it may very well be not surveyed. So it could, you know, there could be things there, but we we don't know at this point. Um, just so just so everyone knows, um, those projects that are selected um, and after they close will receive a an inventory by the main natural areas program. So we'll, we will know more information based on on that inventory. So you, are you suggesting an, an uptick on that? I mean, we, if we can make a very quick change. Yeah. And give it a, at least the two. I don't I don't begin to understand how this one only ends up with the, exactly. with the zero. That's on rare and endangered, yeah. and you're doing yeah. it because of the habitat. Yeah. So that's if we do do that, that, let's keep that in mind for the rest of them. Yeah. So should I? Yeah, yeah, does that set a precedent? That, 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 that moves Johnson Brook to a 67. Well, it does say in our criteria habitat. It does say how to have habitat suitable <clears throat> for rare and endangered. Yeah. I can't find it right now, but it's. So as opposed yeah. to actually uh, it does talk about it. Also, brook trout um, was was mentioned yeah. as being rare. Yeah. They're not yeah. technically an endangered species, but they're certainly a major conservation concern. Yeah. I was amazed. It seemed like 90% of the proposal said wild brook trout habitat. I thought that was <laughs> no. a, <laughs> much, it was a much rarer species uh, that seems very prevalent. It's only rare when I go fish for <laughs> <laughs> Point taken. So I'm OK with adding two to that. Is everyone else OK? Yeah. And so where are we now? 67. Now we're at 78, and now we're at 50. 50. River Fork. Yeah. Muddy River Fork. Yeah. Muddy River Fork. Yeah. OK, Muddy River. Yep, we've got another um, proximity where the average score was not an eligible score. So this is the same um, example of what we did prior. Um, staff identified four different criteria. So the range should be between four and seven. I think similar to the last time, Barbara. <clears throat> Most people gave it a seven, but there were a couple of that went a little higher. So. I gave them the highest of the four to seven. Yeah, yeah. I gave them seven as well. Yeah. I, I think that probably makes sense. Okay. And if it would be a 10 based on our criteria that we set up, and then water access. So I gave them Wait a four. Did, in this first did we go? What yeah, but a four. What yeah, happened to need for? Major land asset. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. we did the. Yeah, we all agreed on 15. I was thinking. <laughs> Done. Give me four on water access because it, it looked to be in an incredibly good spot, even though it was relatively, you know, I didn't know how much of that frontage could be used, but it would look like it was really key in, in terms of being a strategic location. Yep, and I, and they did mention that they were going to build a trail so that people can yeah. access yeah. it, and also from water and from land. There's very little free public access to this, so this would be unique, and particularly I think on that side. On the other side is the state park in Point Sebago. Oh. Gave them four as well, but I was wondering why staff only gave them the two. I think we didn't. 
know about the trail potential. So I think it was just enhanced by the presentation. Yep. Okay. So and we're vote, okay with four. Vote four. Yeah. Finally, 83. Yep. More theory. Open space. Be a four or a six. It, this has got to be a six. I mean, this is. Yeah. Right in Portland, it's in an area that doesn't have a park nearby oh, yeah. and it connects to other yeah. parks. And okay. That's six. Are there any others? Economic. Economic. Three or five? Project structure. Not oh, good. sorry. Project. Oh, yeah. Can you explain that one, Jason? Yes. So, according to the criteria that are in our workbook, um, to get five points for project structure, it has to be a conservation easement. A fee acquisition supported by the by the commu community is a three. So this is not an easement. This is a fee acquisition. So three. So we may have to look at that rule again. <laughs> We're very happy to do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, climate. There was, must have been somebody who gave it a partial. So I think somebody gave it five and it bumped the average up. Oh. Oh, this is an all or nothing score where they have, we have to award either a zero or five. I don't remember what the dials said. That's what I looked at. Yeah. <laughs> I think this was one where this one was for me a really good reason on why we need to adjust our climate scoring criteria because this obviously is. In, when you think about impervious surface in a watershed, this does a lot, mm -hmm. but that's not our criteria. So Far that was low average on everything. Yeah. yeah, this was for me the like, oh yeah, we need to broaden our criteria so that things like this can get captured. I think we really do because the significance of a parcel like this in a city and the cooling effect and the, yeah. the resilience and I mean, there are a lot of attributes um, that it brings in terms of a climate uh, benefit. Kind of benefit. Yeah. And so I think if, if it doesn't rise to what we have in our criteria, I think we need to look at that criteria. Yeah. And I think everyone would agree that the criteria that we are using were not intended for parcels of this size. You know, so it's it's not that the criteria are necessarily wrong, just wrong scale. But do we want to change the score? I would encourage you not to, yeah. only because of what are we published in our RFP. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we can do it now, but it does raise a lot of interesting issues as we review scoring and maybe move away from just five points as a bonus, yeah. but incorporate more broadly into our other criteria. All right, so final score is several six. Last of the preserve expenses. Yeah, that's the open space. We need to go up or down one point. I would. Yeah, I gave it a two, and I'm proud of. I don't know why. Two. Probably because it, it's an expansion to something yeah. that's already there. Yeah, yeah. That's probably what you were thinking. Yeah. So small, too. Yeah. yeah. Two. Everybody else gave a two. And okay. Next is river trail system. system. Must be a two. It will, it will expand on an existing trail system. But a very, very limit. I thought. The trail system criterion was for like being part of a regional. Uh, I just thought just having one small trail <coughs> reserved and expanded by adding didn't feel yeah. like it. I gave it a two as well. I gave it a two. Okay, let's go to. All right. Of course, the criteria is broader than that. You know, it says the project must provide documentation that the project lands will enhance the protection and integrity of the proposed river segment or something. So it's it's not just about the trail itself. It, it's, does it protect a portion of the coastline and habitat for fish waterfall? And but it doesn't. Is that, this one doesn't have any water. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. 
This one doesn't have any water. No, no. no. The, okay. the existing water. parcel has the water. Yeah. And then it goes to Snowmobile Trail, Appalachian Trail. Not yeah. Okay, so final school will be 59. Here, Mont, McClellan. Porter Hill. Porter Hill. Going on in my. Yeah. Porter Hills. Okay. Hill. So we've got a, a zero. This uh, is, this, this, go ahead. This is the same issue as uh, Great Pond Mountain, where there are multiple parcels, some of which have road fronts and some of which don't. What, so what you the same the same uh, process as on that project? I think the score it would be all be scored as though they all had public road frontage. Yeah. It would go with the fifteen. Okay. okay. And proximity. Oh yes. The Again, issue. we're gonna get the average score to an eligible score. Same issue. Yeah. I think seven is probably where we want to go with that one. Yeah. Well, in climate, it looks like there was some discrepancy that it can only be a five. Right? Zero five. Oh, so somebody must have. Watch your yeah. Go we'll with five. I think, it, five. I think it met the criteria. So final score is an 87. Now it's here. Now it's here. Okay. Okay, water access. access. Going to be a four or six. We were at five. Staff is at four. I was at six. I was at six. Six, okay. Six. Okay. All or nothing on climate again. Zero. Zero. Got a zero. Okay. Final score 74. Staples Woodlands. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Don't do that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let it restart. Let's all be back here for lunch. Every state employee's nightmare. We have a little time. <laughs> yeah. Vital ecological value. Uh, staff was at a four. Our average was a three. It must be a two or four. Back. What do you think on that? <laughs> I sat down and I actually went down to two. I yeah. gave it a two. two I gave so. it a two as well, but yeah. two. Two. Okay. Zero. All or nothing on climate. Zero. Someone was feeling very generous with the climate points. Okay. <laughs> Judy, really Judy was making a set watch. Our criteria is too narrow. So. Final score is. Just 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 they listed it. Final score is 66. <laughs> so what was it? 64? 66. Talking Brook. Okay. Here. How did it get up to 66? So here we've got on um, significant major land assets. Staff was at 15. We were averaged at 13. I I gave it a 15. I know this parcel. It's right on the border of Androscoggin County and Cumberland County. And um, it's a it's a very important parcel for a large boost in draws from the north and the south. Yeah, yeah. It's the second largest metropolitan area in the state. So 15. People comfortable with 15. Yeah. Heading and nodding. 15. So I guess I would just say when I think of sort of statewide significance, I would have given it a 15 if it were a community, you know, a uh, community project, but I didn't quite feel like it meant the uh, product that was sort of accept, like a major land asset 
for statewide significance. But I gave it a 10. I'm happy to go with 15, but that. I was looking, Judy, at, you know, it's between the Portland greater metropolitan area. When you say statewide significance, it's between the two largest metropolitan areas. Sure. I mean, we can see that for maybe access, but the significance of a major land asset to me is like a mass, is a really big parcel that's a significant land asset, not necessarily um, accessible to most people. So I just had a different lens that I looked at it with. That, that's all. I wish you'd been in the room when we were talking about um, North Dealing. <laughs> it's got a 15, even okay. though it's, yeah. So that would be, yeah, not that yeah. was not these compare right. projects, but. <laughs> <laughs> chime in and say that this is a community conservation project. There was some question, but the applicant settled on it being a community conservation project, not a statewide. Oh, then I'm sorry, because yeah. my sheet says statewide. Okay. So that, I would be fine with that then. Okay, so 15. And. We need a zero or two on rare and endangered. I think this was a project, we, and we had several of them, where there were multiple parcels, and they talked about both parcels, and it was at times difficult to like, okay, what's on the parcel we're paying for versus the one that's coming in? And, um, I, I gave it a zero was, for that reason. Yeah, it was, zero. yeah. Zero. Yeah. You gave it a zero, Max? <laughs> Listen to the expert. Listen to the expert. I gave it a two, but I'm going to go with Max. <laughs> I will go with Max, but I want to know that there are significant wetlands on here for wading birds and waterfowl, and also the potential for bath habitat. Just want those on the record. They're on the record. Probably some landing turtles there. I think the landing turtles. <laughs> you know, the bats are on there. <laughs> yeah, but it's bad habitat, I should say. I know there's no right whales. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It would be helpful to have context on that potential bat habitat from IFNW. Is that um, no, sort of like every part, every wooded parcel? It, wooded and I mean, virtually the entire state's habitat for bats. So that shouldn't be something that ele I don't think that should that elevates it up because bats are ubiquitous across the entire landscape. In, in almost every landscape. So it's not talking about, about high vernacular. Then that'd be different. Uh, I'm concerned about the quality of the habitat <laughs> and the spread of disease and bats. Is is that so? The, the white nose job. disease is really spread in the high vernacular. So that there's there's not a high vernacular on site, nor within a quarter mile that that we know of here. Um, so I don't I don't. I don't know if this distinguish is any better potential bad habitat than any other block of land in the state. I'll right. defer. <laughs> what does staff give it? Zero. Zero. So we're at zero. I think I think staff. Um, if you to recognize the difference between ecological functions and values and rare and endangered. That's you know that we yeah. looked at. Sure. Okay. It was zero. So final score 72. No open no. space we get to talk about that needs to go be either a four or a six. Again, I'd argue for a six because of its proximity to uh, yeah. Yeah, large numbers of Maine citizens. Okay. Six. six on open space. And then economic benefit needs to be a three or a five. No, I, I was confused to halfway through uh, that and I went and read Appendix D. It's actually community and yeah. economic yep. development. And I, I think it ought to say that there because I was having a hard time figuring out why some were getting three points and some were getting five points on this criteria. And it became a little clearer when I saw the full community definition. benefit and I started counting the number of letters of support and they seem to kind of reflect the, the diversity yeah. yeah yeah that definitely staff look at that sort of diversity of support you know is it have uh businesses and you know community health centers and that kind of diversity shows okay so i gave this a, a, a five after i started thinking of it as community support and why did you give it a five um, partly for what you were saying about its lo location in yeah. between two major 
areas. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I, I was thinking of it as a more direct benefit. So I was thinking of village store in Gloucester, and maybe people uh -huh. would go there for lunch. But if you're going to this parcel, you're probably not going into Lewiston, Auburn, and creating any economic right. benefit. And you're probably not. So I gave it a three on that criteria. Mm -hmm. I gave it a five because of community benefit. I had struggled. In fact, I'd made a note somewhere on my sheets too that we need to needs to say on that line community and economic benefit because that has over 100 visitors daily. I don't know. Open. And five. Hey, I'm good with a five. I just yeah. as terms of dollars going into the um, score seven, of 74. Bay yeah. Brook. I think we're good on this one. What's the score? Yeah. It's final score 84. Yep. Final score 84. That dude is going to build a wall around the Karen. <laughs> <laughs> no, but as, as when we talk about, when we get into the executive session, I would want to that. Yes. I, I would be unwilling to fund this until we see the maps the trails are going to put in. Yeah, yeah, the, the way he described them seems closer. To... Well, 250 feet. I mean, I think our minimum setback will be 500 probably. Is that right, Bethany? I'll, I'll have to check. Yeah, but I mean, normally 250 feet is like the bare bones minimum we require begrudgingly because we don't have a choice. So yeah, that could be a condition that we set. You have a choice. Yeah, yeah. we, we have a choice. So was, I suspect so to 500 foot setback. Okay, Tundra. So we have consensus on the 10 and a final score of 84. Okay. This is Wallamatogas. Did we have a slide for this is the access? No, uh, no, we did not. I think we thought we were all good with that, with the average okay. being what it was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so can you, can we just from where did we end up with access with it? Because I, I, this is the one you contacted me on. So I left blank as like there's no access. Then I felt like he resolved it in the in the dis description. Right. They have actually obtained the signed uh, right of way from the town. Yeah. There is a there is the reason there were still notes in your file is there's still the 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 parcel is comes to a corner. Uh, the town parcel abuts uh, of this project parcel at a corner and the abutting landowner they're in discussions uh, so that you could jump over the pin yes. but the abutting mm -hmm. landowner has indicated their willingness in fact to let them go around that's the one piece that's not quite totally worked out but we're feeling pretty confident the big piece is signed by both parties the corner crossings are in the court out west right now i think i think i think they just resolved it in the federal court but it's now going to a civil they were saying when you step from one corner mm -hmm. to the next you were crossing the airspace of the oh, right. abutters, and they said that was illegal airspace. So it was trust they yep. took them to federal court for trespassing. We know that we have a very friendly um, conservation minded abutter. So we're we're hopeful that that it will resolve. Yeah. OK, so final score will be 73. Great. Is that what that says? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Should have been an eye doctor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Forest. Okay. Access. Uh, we need to get this one into an eligible range. Um, again, this is this is the project in Ellsworth that you'll recall. Aaron described multiple different access opportunities. The one that they are relying on from day one, however, Jason. Is <laughs> they have access on Hannah Way, which is a private road behind the trade wind market in Ellsworth. That's where they intend to build their primary parking area. There is also access from an existing uh, bike, uh, pedestrian and bike trail. Um, the, the category for eight to ten points specifies across adjacent land, conservation land held by the applicant. So. Yeah, I think that's a different. Isn't there a trail school, a uh, trail from the high school as well, from so from the high school use? There is, but they don't have. So I think that that's probably a, a real informal access, but right. they don't have a legal agreement with yeah. the 
uh, City of Ellsworth. I think there was the sort of assumed public access from there, but uh, wanting to limit public use of the school grounds yeah. during the school day. Okay. So it will get used that way, but it's not for our purposes, their legal access. I have a lot of contentious whale meetings in that school, and it's nice to know I've got an escape. Route. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason, just to clarify, Tanner's Way is Tanner's Way Road. Is a private road. Private. And so if they have access over that, it has to be deeded to them, a deed which, they to have. Them, which they have. They, ha they have that existing legal access along this private road, okay. which is why staff scored them at seven. Okay. Which yeah. is the maximum That's you can give for that type of access. And and yeah. I think this is the one they have envisioned using the same road that the high school's on at some point. Right. Yes. 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 And so just, I think the seven is appropriate. Yeah, I agree. And so, the, the, and I, and I think it was clarified in the description, but it was it was confusing in the maps that they sent that piece for further development yeah. is not part of this project. So I'll just make okay. sure that's clear on the record. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Final score. Sixty nine. And that includes the consensus scoring process. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Could you talk about that price that you were concerned about trail access again? I think I may have looked at another process. Which one were you concerned about? Um, the one that has that Harris quality. The Harris Harris Yeah. Yeah, and you're concerned about the proximity and the. Well, I was concerned about their desire to put on several miles of new trails and how that would potentially uh, impact the herons are pretty sensitive to yeah. disturbance. So, you know, I was con concerned about where they were going to put the trails and yeah. what, you know, what that layout would be and yeah. how close they were going to get. And when we asked him, he said, you know, 250 feet, which. I don't think that's a grand tree, so. Are you I, also concerned about the ATV trails and the proximity on that? So I think the ATV trail is already in existence there. Mm -hmm. So it's already been used. I don't think they plan to expand the ATV trails, if I'm correct. So that wouldn't uh, bother me as much. And, and honestly, this may be contrary, but sometimes those the noise, the noisy things are less problematic for wildlife because they hear them from a long distance. And so, but uh, people coming in close and scaring, startling the bird and causing it to flush off is much more problematic. It's the same with dogs. I also have concerns because they're talking about dogs on that site and that they're going to have to be unleashed, but I'd, I'd like to see how that's going to be regulated. So those are my concerns with that site. Do we, do we have uh, the ability to condition something like that in terms yeah. of dogs and well, you could condition that they must be on the leash, but I, mean, I don't know if we've. We can we that we have lots of options in terms of management plan consultation with IFNW. It was not an IFNW sponsored project; it's a BPL sponsored project. So we have we can talk about that in executive session. Lots of different options on how we can yeah. make dogs, sure there's good communication. Leash, we've all been on trails with dogs. Yeah, yeah. That's to be a leash. very hard one to require endangered occurring. That brought to mind a question of the existing. Um, visitation site. Mm -hmm. um, did that require approval? I mean, it's obviously in existence, and apparently, it's you know they're accustomed to it. But do we, if if for instance um, somebody in the know on the board said, "Gee, we this is even though it's been there, um, and we could we condition not that we're going to hear." That it be moved back or restructured. No, that we well. So I think not for a parcel that we're not reviewing. I don't think right. So we couldn't go in and, okay, and say to an adjacent case. landowners, you need to move these trails. No, right. we could not do that. Okay. If it was a match parcel, I would argue that you could. Sure. But yeah, okay. I mean, the only time the department has the authority to comment on projects like that is generally when it's in okay. in okay. development through DEP. You know. Uh, so we, we don't usually get the opportunity to kind of weigh in on those things. Mr. Chairman, just one quick question on the parcels. Um, the match parcels, 
have to meet all the same requirements that so for access and everything else, there's no distinction. There, we receive um, appraisals for match parcels. Those get reviewed by staff instead of the AOC. And yeah, all other conditions are the same for match parcels. So it's covered under our project agreement, our funding agreement. If there are special conditions, we would note that in the project agreement. But our workbook states that all, all conditions are the same. Yes. OK, I'm going to move us just so that we can stay on target. If you have your agenda, um, it, it looked like this and it was just a couple pages long. It was at the back of the first um, packet that you got. It's paper clipped um, in the back. Yes, Roger's got it. There's, there's a, a slide or a handout that you, this should look familiar. You've seen this before. Yep. Um, and we talked about, and it, it came to my attention that we have not ever voted on set asides. We've talked about things like 5% um, set asides. So, so what I am, I'm bringing us into is uh, preparing for a discussion on how much money we have to allocate towards projects. Um, that's our next step is determining our available funds. Um, are we in executive session? We are not in executive session. Okay. Nope. We will take a, We will do a vote okay. to enter into executive session. Um, so what you have in your board packet shows the 5%. That's what we've talked about, and that's what we've uh, presented previously. What staff has done, because we know that there has been interest in, in more than 5%, is provided you with a couple of different options to consider. We need a vote on this because it will set our available funds. Um, so if you look at, Jason, can you bump that up just a little bit? The column on the left shows that 5%. Um, and I think it's important to focus on the... Um, Which one we're you looking at, left or right screen? Left screen. Okay. Um, we're talking about two year, two fiscal years worth of funds, the one that is ending in June and then the one that is starting in July. So we're talking about two fiscal years of funds today for the most part. Um, if we used 5%, uh, you would see that um, there are a number of calculations there. 87% of funds would be allocated towards projects. Um, we would have uh, $11 million available entering into round B. We know we have $5 million in request for round B. And um, for round C, if you scroll up just a little bit more, uh, it would allow us to have just about $5.5 million, um, uh, just under $5 million, $4.7 million available for projects. Um, and we know we have somewhere between six and seven and a half million dollars in requests for round C. So we don't have enough funds to fully fund every project between A, B, and what we anticipate in C. We look at two fiscal years. That's at 5%. If we look at the next column over, I believe that is. Uh, 10 percent. Nope. This, this that's the statutory maximum. This is calculated based on the 5 percent. That's 5 percent of the appraised property value for the, the uh, projects based on the actual numbers from A and B and estimates for round C. So that would leave 71 percent of available funds. Wait, I'm sorry. Is the middle row what Jason just said? That's right. Yep. 71 percent of um, available funds eligible for projects. And we would, if if we fully funded all of round B, that would leave us with $2.7 million available for round C. That's the third option. So the third option, if we go over, this is 10% of the LMF award. And I, let me, so let me just be really clear. This is 10% of the LMF award for access improvement grants for stewardship, 
Um, we're not going to talk about capital improvements. We're going to set that aside when we talk about farmland. So access improvement and stewardship. I believe Jason refresh my memory, we would still keep legal and inventories at 5% yeah. under this scenario. So I can tell you that 5% is sufficient to cover our, the state's legal expenses and it leaves funds available left over for MNAP and Maine Historic Preservation inventories, which are statutorily required. So that stays at five, but our sort of post-closing awards for access improvements and stewardship would be at 10% of the LMF award. So that would leave at 5%, we have 80, 87% of funds going towards project. At 10%, we have 80% of funds going towards projects. We fully funded um, A and B projects. That would leave $3.7 million available for C, round C projects. So those were three options we came up with for you all to consider. We need to, to take a vote to set those so that we know what we're going into with our, our round B projects and round C. I think this, this will also be helpful because at the end of this process, we'll be able to let the round C projects know, hey, you're competing for X number of dollars. Can you mm -hmm. step back? Where's the, the, the one that was on the, the right side? side that, yep. Um, can you remind me? Um, 5% for farmland and working waterfront. Did we, was that a statute, a statute this time or was this a? You, my friend, your working waterfront projects don't get capital improvement grants. No, 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 or... I'm sorry, not five. Uh, the working waterfront <coughs> farmland, I shouldn't be looking at the percentage here. No, you should. Just the, just look the at available funds, the, the overall available funds through this general fund allocation for farmlands and working waterfronts. Was that set in statute or is that? Something that we that is set in statute as course, minimums at the minimum. So there, the board has the leeway to allocate Fair. more money to those yeah. programs. And so what you're talking about here then is not That's cutting into standard. any of the other programs. That's right. That's we're going to hold those off until September when we're allocating funds right. to those projects. Unless just throw this out there, the board, you know, unless we knew there was some really good working waterfront and farmland projects that we're not going to be able to fund and we're going to need to. If we're allowed to move money from CNR over, is that an option? We can we can you can go above the minimum. But yes, Judy, it, the short answer is the board could decide to do that. The board could decide today that we want to move X number of dollars over to. I mean, I'm not saying we want to do that. I'm just saying that you that have the authority to do that. that. That's the minimum you're going to get. Could get more if yeah. the board chose to reallocate funds. Yep. Yeah. So yesterday or Tuesday, I guess, uh, we discussed allocation versus disbursement. So this assumes that funds will be dispersed, correct? By the end of fiscal 23. So, I mean, I'll just. I'll, I know what you get in that, Barbara, but and it's very difficult to sort of reconcile when money's been obligated, but still like in the account. So I'm just really cautious about overspending the money because that once we obligate money, it's committed. So I think of it as by and large gone. You right? Think of it as it's it's spent. Like we, we're committed to spending that money for a particular project for a particular project. And I would just be really cautious about kind of almost spending it twice, knowing we're going to get money in another six months. Because as you know, Senator Breen said, there's actually not a guarantee that that money's going to come in, right? The legislature could change that decision. They could change it. However, if it was obligated. I mean, no, once it's obligated, you can't. But I'm just saying, you, I wouldn't want to obligate it twice. They, they, they like, actually can. It, your exactly. obligation is different than, <laughs> so uh, uh, we can't tie the hands of a future legislature. Right. So if it was an obligate, if we obligated uh, FY24, for example. Right. That's what I, I'm cautious about, sort of. So we say we can, we're going to spend the total available $6 million right now. 
And in the next round, we're also going to spend another nine million because we've got several really good projects, you know, whatever. So you have another six. So we over obligate because we are anticipating an additional $10 million disbursement. But the next legislature could take that $10 million away. Really? Oh, uh, and I would say, likely, I think, but we ha you have to, you have to. Oh. And even though on top of that, that, I will add that, um, and this has been done, This I, I've lived through this, a governor can freeze your accounts. And so even though you have the money there, they can prevent you from spending it. So Wait. so just yeah. be aware that, so just so I'm clear, so and because I might, and I might be confusing myself, which is very common occurrence. Um, starting in July, yep. we have a new fiscal year, July 1. We will get a new. All of the money from FY21 will move forward and yep. we will have FY21 and FY22 available to us. So when we talked about the amount of money that would be available for the round C, does that include the additional that, money? That includes two fiscal years. All the numbers on the left are FY20 are, are monies that the two years worth of monies. And so then in July that that is already including the the money that will come in in July. Yes, right. What is, okay. what is shown here is the current fiscal year we're in and the fiscal year coming up. Yep. OK, yes. And so to spend beyond that, I think would be. Imprudent because we don't know what's going to happen. Strikes me we should spend the whole 40 million by November 1st. Well, we can't. <laughs> yeah, we can't. Unfortunately, we can spend a million. Yeah, 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 yeah I mean. One of my biggest concerns was losing projects. Um, you know that I wanted to obligate if the project was great, and we've lost a lot of projects over time. Correct? That didn't come to fruition, took longer than they we expected. I mean, that, it, it happens with every funding round. Where a, a, but, you know we have. But that was a big concern, a major concern for me. And when I heard we could obligate it, of course, this is before you comment you made that I felt good that I was able to obligate it and you know if they had some constraints um, we that particular you know those projects were protected but this adds a ripple to me so why is it why is it add a ripple well I think once it's obligated it's relatively the state's committed to spending that money on that project we basically sign it to a, a contract but if it rolled, you know, it, you're suggesting to me that a future legislator could could actually impact that obligation. No, they no, this, they they, they will like impact 24. the next round of money coming in. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is, so if, this, if you were thinking the, about your checking account, okay. right, you're, you're paying your bills and I'm going to pay five hundred dollars for my car payment today. But I think it's going to take them 10 days to, to cash the check, cash that check. I might spend that $500 again, and then I'm going to be in a little bit of trouble if it only takes them two days to cash that check. Right? So if I've tried to use that money to, to, to cash, to carry me through to my next paycheck, and I think, well, they won't cash it till I get paid next Friday, and they do cash it, and I've already spent it, and now I'm in trouble. So that's what we're trying to prevent. So trying to prevent, you know, <laughs> obligating money that, we that don't the legislature that, or that the you know that hasn't come into our coffers yet. It's not in the checking account yet. So let's not let's not spend it before we have it. Does that these, these two years we will have we have it. We yeah, yes. we have we this, have it and they're have el money. eligible for us to use. Um, but we had 10 million as of last July 1st. Right. Uh, July so 1st. just to be clear. All of the money is in our account. Right. All of it is there. I report on it in every every board meeting. It's all there. The distinction is that we are not eligible to sh to spend twenty million at this point. We just for a second. But we will be in July too. No, we're starting. We're in a current fiscal year that ends June thirtieth. We have ten million dollars for that for the fiscal year that ends in June. The end of June, starting July one, opens up another ten million dollars that we can spend. 
the previous year rolls forward. So we that's the 20 million. The remaining 20 million, we have to wait until future fiscal years to spend that money. And that's the money that Judy's talking about. That that it's in our account. We see it, but a, a future legislature could come in and, and sweep it. Because we're it's not eligible to be spent at the time. And, and the just time so being. we're clear, like the, the purchases won't allow her, we're not they're not going to allow us to spend the 40 million. Yes, we can't. Spend. So it's not like we can see. We can't spend it, but we can't spend it even though they can see it. The, the, the state process won't allow that. We can't. So we can't. I don't think we can I don't think we can put more than twenty million dollars worth of projects under contract. Right. Correct. No, wait a minute. Is that true? I think that is true. Is because that's a different, that's a nuance that I haven't heard before. Yeah. Because those funds aren't available to us. They are not available until the fiscal year that they are allocated. Okay. I, I believe you could obligate and do your due diligence and then go under contract in 2024. <laughs> right. That's a different thing. And exactly. that's, see, I, I do, I, I'm, I'm a little uh, less risk averse from this standpoint when it comes to obligation of the money. Um, I think we're going to be short going into this next round. FY 23 is begins July 1. Right, so we'll have the, these two fiscal years and then we know and I think we, we talked about this the other day. We know that these next round of projects coming in, if we have how many right now we've got anticipate what? Of work we're working for. We're working for. I think it's seven, seven, so, seven potential projects. So we will be short in seven million. If we fully funded, we'd be short, right, going into that round. Potentially significantly, if we didn't know that we could, double, uh, obligate, and then move those projects, let those projects move along. And Correct. We would be short. We can We do not currently in two fiscal years have enough funds to fully fund every project in A, B and C. And I am I we have more data available and we will talk about that in terms of when people expect to close and all that. We can talk about that. I want us to focus on set asides right now. Remind me when the third round is due. Uh, we will be making those allocations in September. So working so forest, yeah. farmland, and working waterfront in Waterfront Center, Center, whatever it's has come in. Oh, okay, they've come in. They've come in. Okay. Yeah. Mac. I, I think this is <clears throat> what uh, Judy uh, echoing what Judy said at the out, outset, uh, if I understood correctly. I would be a little conservative about obligating future future funds, even though it's not um, you know, fiscally we can we can do that. Uh, but who knows what proposals are going to be coming down the line in the in the future to, and to sort of get ahead of ourselves. I'd rather be a little bit, I mean, yes, we could fund all the projects that are in front of us today, fine. And we could fund all the ones in September that we anticipate if we, some of them become obligations that we don't meet until 2023. I, I'd be a bit conservative about um, about that because of uh, <clears throat> I can't assume that all, all the projects in front of us are, are are as good as the projects we might see a couple of years from now. I, I think the to build on that, I think um, we are balancing multiple public policy objectives. We want to um, be able to fund both community conservation projects. You know, statutorily, that's a priority, and we want to be able to fund. Um, those kinds of projects that um, capture values through working forests. So we that those tend to be larger acreages. They speak well to the 30 by 30 initiative. We want to be looking at climate resilience. So being able to fund a blend, I think, is really important. I, I totally agree. Uh, but I just want to suggest that we have a financial responsibility to make sure that we are funding really good projects, whatever category they're in. And so I don't I don't feel pressure to fund a project that I don't think is a really good project just because we have money. So I think we we can and should look at all of these projects and make sure that we think, yes, this is worth whatever dollar of the state's money. 
you know, that this is worthy of the LMF program. It meets all the criteria. You know, it, it's going to provide uh, value to the people of the state, um, not just spending any of the money from the account. I agree wholeheartedly. I think at the end of the day, we need to be looking for the, the good projects, the really good projects that meet the criteria for the LMF program. And I, I just want to say um, that I I also at the same time think that if there is if there are a lot of really good projects and we are looking at obligating this this funding potentially faster than we expected or have been told that we could that this is you know if we can show the demand there is opportunity to advocate for future funding and I, I think that that's part of what we need to be thinking about too. That, that that's that is part of the strategy. When I say I'm a little bit uh, less risk averse, um, that that's because of the strategy for across the river. This is this is a new problem for us. We right. never had general fund allocation. It's always been based on bond issues. Um, and this may be the. I mean, if we go continue to go down the road of a recession as it looks, this will maybe be the last time we yep. have general fund allocation. Didn't we have a three thousand three million dollar? Yes, early on in the nineties, yeah, there was one. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I certainly agree that today we need to fund projects regardless of our scores. We're looking at each project as an individual project and its merit. Um, so we'll know better at the end of the day how many, how much funds that we've committed. There are a lot of unknowns out there. You know, we have um, the potential for some projects to come in, but our record is that they don't all necessarily materialize. So saving money, assuming that is not what our history has been. You know, so for example, for this round, at one point I heard 32 projects and potential increase, and now we're dealing with 20. So, um, you know, I just want to put that in perspective. Might not close, and that's been our history too. So uh, I'm a little less risk averse, knowing that our history shows that some of those dollars will never even be asked for and potentially not expended. And some of those projects take a lot of time to close. We talked about the average closing date too. Yeah. So the From my experience in the legislature, what's very appealing is a pot of unused money. It's Use it up. <laughs> Let's grab it. So uh, what is not as appealing is obligated limits. Then there's a real breach of trust with uh, the legislative intent. And remember, the whole legislature isn't going to turn over, so we're going to have a lot of people right. there who voted yep. unanimously to give this $40 yep. million. So I think there's some middle ground in here. I don't think these numbers are locked in stone. Um, and, you know, time moves quickly, and I think there's some flexibility to look ahead uh, to the funding that we'll receive in fiscal 24. This, this will this will shake out in the executive session as we start looking at how we want to fund. Yeah. So the question is, how much money do we want to allocate yeah. today? <laughs> and that's what I was yeah. going to address is that my first look at it, I'm the most comfortable going with the 5% war that we've been doing to make the smallest possible funding gap. I mean, so looking at it and, and that's the that's the balance that we can um, have smaller um, uh, access improvement and stewardship awards and do more projects or we can do fewer projects and have more money to invest in those other things. That's really what I think comes down to. I prefer putting money towards projects. Quite honestly. And I would say based on yesterday, we asked a lot about stewardship plans. We heard a lot about their management plans. Somebody, and most somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a goddess in Washington. What did your husband say when you told us? <laughs> um, but anyhow, my point is that uh, Nowadays, it's common practice, it's standard operating procedure for entities to plan ahead for stewardship. Yeah. Will it be desirable for us to play a role? I think it will, particularly in municipalities 
that are depending on their annual budget for stewardship, that seems not to be as positive a strategy for taking care of their lands. But we have a stewardship committee we're going to be meeting and really thinking about, you know, how to allocate these funds wisely. Uh, and I, I think there are a number of possibilities here. But I would favor the 5% right now going forward um, because I think that gives us enough to work with um, where stewardship is needed. And remember, those aren't guaranteed. You know, those those can be based on the need of the applicant. We'd like to make that a motion. Yeah, we've got a motion um, prepared for you right here, Barbara. <laughs> where is it? On the right hand side, I think you can um, combine that. I think what I'm hearing you saying is 5% for everything. Yeah. Right. So I would I would uh, put a motion forward that we the board vote to set aside 5% of our funds. What do you want me to say here for stewardship, for capital improvements, for access improvements and for legal and inventory? You got it. So second. Yeah. Second. Got a motion by Barbara was seconded by Roger. Um, I don't be second. Calm down. The replay. And just for the clarity of the record, the motion is to set aside 5% of funds for legal and inventory, access improvements, capital improvements, and stewardship. All with all members. 5% for each category. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. With all members of the board present, is there any, uh, well, first, are there any questions or comments? Seeing none. With all members of the board present, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing no objections, again, with all members of the board present, the motion, motion passes unanimously. Okay, so Jason, can you go to the, with that information, can you go to the next uh, spreadsheet? This one? Yes, this one. There it is. Okay, so we are at 1044. I'm hoping we can get this, have this conversation in the next 15 minutes so that we can enter executive session for an hour. Um, so just in terms of a time check, that's what I'm hoping we can do. Yeah. So staff put together um, this spreadsheet, which shows all projects with all their final scores. And we wanted to just think about in the public session, some different funding strategies you could consider. We do not have to vote on anything. You don't have to decide anything. It's just an opportunity to have a public transparent conversation about what strategy you might use in executive session. So um, I- We're gonna have to do something bigger. to, yeah. yeah. I think if you shift it, we don't need to see the comments. Are there any, yeah. Or can we get up and stand close? A pair of binoculars maybe. Yeah. yeah. Can, can you give us a hard copy? Can you print these for us? Uh, Take a look we can yeah, print them. But we can print them for you when you go into executive session. Okay. Okay. I'd like that. No, that's, that's better. better. That's better, right there. Yeah. So we have projects to the left, um, acres, scores, the closing date. Uh, what I wanted to show you here: every single project that wow. we have selected intends to close in the next fiscal year. So that means within the next six months. A, a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there are several options for uh, consideration here. We could take the approach of funding in full. We right. could take the approach of um, figuring out what the um, the shortfall is and reducing equally amongst projects. We could um, sort by score and not fund um some of the lowest scored projects i mean those are all the types of options that we have available to us you can see on the bottom left hand option one fund all projects fully option two fund projects at x percent so 80 percent of their of their ask we fund i'm just making something up there or another option fund projects scored higher than x percent you know like they're just reiterating those are just some of the options that we put out there for you. We can play with some of those. This isn't a live Excel table, so we can kind of, you know, what would it look like if we can do that, if that's of use? Give me an example. Jason, could you sort by board score? Sorry. 
There you go. So that just shows you how the bottom projects would fall into. And, and this is this is an approach the board has taken in the past um, for projects. And when we didn't have enough money, um, there's always a desire to fund, you know, fund all and cut so back. But we've taken the approach of saying, OK, below 70, you know, just now it's an arbitrary number. I'm not suggesting that um, to try to ensure that we're staying within the funding gap. Is it is it uh, possible to discuss individual projects and their financial merits or demerits? That we'll do that in, in executive, executive session. session. Right. Yeah. But yeah. that, uh, but that is yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And readiness is a factor here too, because as we've gone through these projects, some projects need some work before they're truly ready, you know, to move ahead with an appraisal access issues, for example. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have on your scoring sheets um, that we handed back to you. The at the bottom of every one, there's sort of the other considerations that are things like geographic representation. Um, you know, there's a whole list of them there. Those are similar to readiness. Those are other considerations that you may want to think about in terms of your awards. It does, it does strike me that. There's quite a bit of pent up demand here. So oh, absolutely. Even though <laughs> projects, they wanted to get in on this round, whether they were truly ready or not, because they were worried that yeah. there yeah. wouldn't be money. I will say, however, I think the applicant community took that readiness very seriously. Mm -hmm. I think we have more projects with appraisals in hand or pending in the next month or two than we've had in a long time. So they, I, they responded to that very well. I, I agree with that. I mean, I think I was impressed with the quality of, the, of these, but it does represent for me pent up demand. Absolutely. Yeah, that we may not see in subsequent rounds. Yep, so, especially when we're talking about pre-acquired properties. We have several of those. Timing wise, a failed project here, you know, say one of them. We did a cutoff and said no. When's their next opportunity? Um, well, you all, yeah, if you choose to do it again, it would be probably September or November, depending on how extensively the board wanted to change the workbook. Extensive changes to the workbook would put this off to November. So yeah. this, this two, fall. That's not two years. Down that's the right. Road. This fall. So I think for, for this discussion, I mean, we just have to agree that those options are what we have available to us for funding strategies. And then as we go into executive session, we can we can fine tune that um, based on all of the examples that have been given. So if everybody is comfortable with that, then the next step would be a motion to go to executive session. And we have. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to go into executive session, then we're going to we'll, we'll do that motion, and then we'll take a break. Okay. And then I move, we're moving on executive session. Hold on. We've oh. got us. We have to say it a certain way. Yeah. Um, we want you forward. I think everyone understands what we're doing in executive session. So here is the top one only. This is the one we read to go into executive session. Uh, I move that in accordance with Title I, Chapter 13, the board will enter executive session to select finalists and make preliminary financial allocations. Executive session is used to ensure the board's preliminary financial allocation do not prejudice the competitive or bargaining position of the applicants. Okay. Second, seconded uh, by Commissioner Camuso. Um, I am not going to read that back into the record. It's clear uh, based on the reading, and it is on the screen now for the members of the public to hear that have that are online. Uh, is there any questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none. Is there any objections to the motion? Seeing none. With all members of the board present, the motion passes without objection. So that puts us into executive session. Yeah, so that puts us into executive session. So I would ask staff to please shut off the teams 
So we are now out of executive session uh, after a very lengthy and um, uh, very productive conversation about these projects, and we have a motion. Barbara. I move that the following projects uh, have received a preliminary allocation of five million sixty seven one hundred and seventy two of LMF conservation and recreation funds. Bonnebeg Mountain, Bittner, Camp Guston, East Wyndham Community Forest, Fort O'Brien Edition, Great Pond Mountain Wildlands Expansion, Jockey Cap, Johnson Brook, Keezer Corridor, Patterson, Muddy River Forest, North Deering Park, Plaisted Preserve Expansion, Porter Hills, Searsmont, McClellan, Staples Property, Talking Brook, Bear Brook, Tondro, Wallamatogas Mountain, Whitney Forest. Second. We have a motion on the table. It's seconded by Commissioner Camuso. Um, I am not going to read the projects, but the uh, again, but the just for the record, um, all of the projects have received a preliminary allocation of five million six hundred and sixty-seven thousand one hundred and seventy-two dollars of LMF conservation and recreational funds. Are there any questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, because this is a um, uh, a final round. Um, and um, a motion, excuse me, because this is a preliminary allocation for this, for the finalists, uh, I'm going to do a roll call vote. And if she, are you ready for the roll call? Yep. Um, Mac? Yes. Kim? Yes. Judy? Yes. Amanda? Yes. Roger? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Bob? Yes. Chair votes yes. With all of those present voting in the affirmative, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, so thank you very much to the board. Uh, and I want to also thank all of the, hopefully we have a lot of applicants that are listening. Um, the board has been very consistently through our discussion in executive section, commenting on the great presentations that we received. Um, it gave us a lot of clarity uh, in making our uh, final decisions. Um, on the 10B finals. So I want to thank you all for the work that you did. Um, and before I ask for any last comments on the board, we do have members of the public uh, listening in. I would like um, Sarah, if she would, to just make sure she describes how you will be communicating with finalists. Sure. So uh, award letters will be sent to all finalists indicating um, your award amount, any special conditions identified by the board, and standard conditions of the board, as well as next steps and how you how you can move your project on to the next step. Great, thank you. So after a day and a half of uh, a lot of activity, um, I would say this has been an incredibly productive uh, day and a half overall. Um, I, I appreciate everybody's expertise uh, and thought about how we were to move forward. Um, it is nice to see the energy and the energy reflected from the applicants. So um, with that, I want to do any, do you have any additional? Information up, is up there on our next board meeting and our next AOC meetings. That's all I got. That's all you got. Barbara, did you have comments? I was just saying move, we adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Seconds all around. <laughs> Passing in. Thanks, everybody.